what, what a great day, and I love that song we just heard together. My dad would say, if that doesn't get your fire going, your wood's wet. So we are excited to be with you today, and uh, man, I have to tell you, I miss you guys. Good gracious. I, uh, I, you know, you'd think uh, by this time I'd get used to preaching to an uh, empty uh, uh, auditorium or the sound crew and the camera guys would get saved and, and, uh, and my, my job would be over. But, uh, you know, as long as they come, I'm going to preach to them and just unload the wagon on these guys. Uh, but now in seriousness, we do miss you. We're excited, though, that we can partner together. And I'm so proud of you as a church and how you continue to faithfully give and reach out to your neighbors and check on others. And every week we are uh, we're doing a drive-through uh, food pantry and thousands of people are being encouraged with that. And, and so it's just, uh, it's a joy uh, to be with you. I know that some of you have noticed that, uh, that I hadn't had a haircut and I need one, but you do too. And some of you, your true hair colors are beginning to show right now. So it might be good that we're quarantined. I don't know. I do know this, though. Uh, I've been giving some thought to it. Whoever determined that liquor stores were essential in the middle of all of this and barbers are not, I'm convinced is some bald guy somewhere on a committee, and he made the decision that this is essential and, uh, and barbers are not. But, uh, hey, you know, if, uh, if the fact that my hair is getting bigger and bigger bothers you, just go look in the mirror. You're in the same boat I am. In fact, we're all in the same boat. In fact, I want to pray uh, before we get into our message today for you and, and for your family and the challenges that we face because... Man, this whole thing has created some unique challenges for us. Uh, I want you to specifically pray for families who are separated from loved ones that are in the hospital. Uh, you know, visiting folks in the hospital is a big part of what we do in, in ministry, and we've not been able to do that. And then just I've been reminded of, of the fact that families who have family members in the hospital can't see them. And so many of the people that are in the hospital today feel alone. Uh, and so we just need to pray for those that are there. It may have nothing to do with the virus, but they're there in the hospital and, and they're alone. Pray for the doctors and nurses. They're just overwhelmed. And the fact that I'm, I have so many in the medical world that are a part of my immediate family with my wife and, and both are, are two of my three sons in the medical world, uh, recognizing that they're just, they continue to work. Um, they go to work just like they always have, but with greater workload and intensity. So we just need to pray for that and pray for those that have lost their jobs and pray for those that are uh, wondering about where they're going to make rent next month. I mean, these are just the challenges that have emerged from all of this are overwhelming. But you remember what I've told you as we walk through this together. Prayer is not the thing that we do so that we can kind of get that out of the way to do the real business of the church. Prayer is the business of the church. And so we just need to pray for one another in those situations for all of our government leaders who are making decisions. And man, listen, before we're critical of them and the decision they make, they've never been here before. Nobody's ever walked this path before. And I know they're going to make some mistakes. I know they're going to, uh, to do some things that are wrong, but we just need to pray that God gives wisdom and direction and all of that. So let's just stop and pray for that need before we uh, uh, open our word together and, and see a word for us in the midst of this uh, challenge that we're facing. Father, you're so good to us. We love you. Thank you for the way you're at work in our life. Now, I always find comfort, Father, in the fact that you are... Uh, you're not surprised by what's happened. You're here today. You're in tomorrow. So we can trust you today knowing that you've already been into tomorrow. So give us today what we need for today and to prepare us for tomorrow. We trust you. We pray for those that are in the hospital sick and some unrelated to the challenge that we're facing today with the virus, but, but they're alone. And would you just touch them today and let them know that they're not alone, they're there, and comfort their family to know that they're not alone, that you're with them in these moments. For those that have lost loved ones and have to kind of walk through the valley of the shadow of death and the grieving process with limited numbers of friends around them, I pray that, that you and the power of your Holy Spirit would be that great comforter to them in, in these times. 
Father, thank you that we can step up as your church and be your arms and feet and hands and, and your voice and your ear in these moments. And we want to do that as, uh, as we continue. Father, thank you for your word. Open it to, to our hearts today. Open our hearts to it today that we would be responsive and receptive to what you have to say is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, I, I want to continue today a uh, uh, series of messages that we started last time we were together on Easter Sunday talking about the resurrection. Now, the reason I want to do that is because we have a tendency to compartmentalize things in our life. So we, we have Christmas and we, we, we get the Christmas boxes out and we decorate. And then after Christmas, we get the boxes back out and we take down the decorations and we put the Easter decorations up and all of those things. And so because last week was Easter, we have a tendency to move forward. We're not going to talk about the resurrection anymore. We wait for next year to talk about the resurrection. But I want you to understand that the resurrection was the major theme of the church from the moment it happened till today. In fact, let me tell you this. Did you know that it was, it was over 300 years after the resurrection before the cross ever became a symbol of the church. Within the first 300 years after the resurrection, nobody would have ever considered putting a cross on top of a place where Christians gathered because their emphasis was not on the cross. It was always on the resurrection. It was always about the power of the resurrection, Jesus coming back to life. And so I want to make sure that over the next few weeks, we don't forget that and we begin to talk about the power of the resurrection in our life. Now, to do that, what we did last time we were together is we looked at the life of Peter. We, can, we know so much about Peter. In fact, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter's name is mentioned more than any other name with the exception of Jesus. Only Jesus is mentioned more in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John than Peter. So we know a lot about Peter. And we know a lot about his life before the resurrection. And we know a lot about him after the resurrection. So he becomes this perfect person for us to look at to see what difference can and does the resurrection make in our lives? And what we discovered last time we were together is that the resurrection brings hope. And we saw Peter restored in his relationship with God because of the resurrection. You and I can be restored to right fellowship with God. The Bible tells us our sin separates us from God. So we don't have a right relationship with God. And so God comes in the person of Jesus, lives, dies, rises again. And in the resurrection, you and I are given an opportunity to have a right relationship with God. The resurrection is evidence that God accepted Jesus' death as payment for our sin so that when we believe in him, we can be forgiven and restored to right fellowship with him. So when we look at Peter's life and we recognize that his story ended sadly in the Gospels, he had denied Jesus, he was at a down point in his life, never believed it could ever be the same, never believed that he could be restored, not after what he had done. And he becomes an example of many of you. Many of you still believe the lie that because of things that you have done in your life, because of thoughts you've had, actions that you have taken, you believe that even though God loves you, he could never love you completely. You could never know him fully because of things you've done. And Peter, he was right where you are. And he came to understand that you can be restored because of the resurrection. And, uh, and, and so we looked together last time at John chapter 21 uh, at the story of Jesus restoring Peter and how he restores us. Well, after that, what happens? After Jesus is with the disciples there on the Sea of Galilee, he spends, we know, from the time of the resurrection and the time 
Jesus ascends and goes into heaven. He spends 40 days with the disciples. So he teaches them, and man, that would have been an incredible 40-day period of time. So Jesus teaches them, hey, guys, do you remember when I said this? And I made, that, was a, that was a reference to the resurrection. So he, he really begins to unfold the mysteries and truths of the Bible to them in these 40 days that he invests in their lives. After that 40-day period of time, he ascends and goes into heaven. So what happens? Last time we were together, he's on the banks of the Sea of Galilee with the disciples as a part of that 40 days, spending time with them. After that, Peter and the disciples go back to Jerusalem. They're in Jerusalem. Jesus finishes up his earthly ministry, commissions them to go into all the world. He then ascends into heaven. After he ascends into heaven, the disciples now, they socially isolate themselves into an upper room. They go into quarantine. So they understand what you're going through. They go into quarantine. They're socially isolated for a period of time because Jesus said, as he ascends into heaven, stay here in Jerusalem until the promise of the Holy Spirit comes. And so they stay in Jerusalem until Pentecost which is another one of the feast days we'll talk about in a minute. And Pentecost comes, the Holy Spirit comes. And then the story picks up in the book of Acts. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Acts, because what I want to do is I want to begin to look at Peter's life as it is recorded in the book of Acts to see the difference between Peter before the resurrection and his life after the resurrection. And what that will do is help us understand that what happened to him can happen to us. Before the resurrection, he was defeated. He was in his sin. But after the resurrection, he was forgiven. He was restored in right fellowship with God. And he receives this incredible power. Now, what I'm going to do today, I want to look at a message Peter preaches. On Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, God presents himself in a powerful way. There are many people that are in Jerusalem who had made the journey to Jerusalem because of the feast day of Pentecost. Pentecost was one of those feast days. It was, uh, it, it was the feast, one of the feasts that required men, uh, Jewish men, to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So there were foreigners from all over the world who had made this journey here. God shows up on Pentecost, the person of the Holy Spirit, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. All of the believers are filled with the Holy Spirit, and Peter preaches this sermon. Now, I want to I read the sermon that he preaches because I really believe that when we see Peter preach this sermon, you begin to see the difference between the Peter of the Gospels before the resurrection and the Peter after the resurrection. In fact, let me just say this to you. And I know I'm spending a lot of time building this up before we get to the text and get to the message. But what else do you have to do? Okay? You're doing nothing. So just sit here and hang with me. I'm just going to kind of speak into this a little bit more. you got the time. I mean, good grief. You're getting to sit there in your pajamas and listen to the message and you get to eat breakfast. I'm, I'm thinking that one of the things that may come out of this is that when we come back, you're going to expect us to serve breakfast or something. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so what happens is Peter, after he receives the, the power of the Holy Spirit, he stands up and he, he walks outside and he begins to preach. And he preaches this powerful message. Now, you've got to remember, when Jesus first meets Peter, all the way back in John chapter 1, Andrew brings Peter to Jesus. And when Andrew brings Peter to Jesus, he um, introduces Peter to Jesus. Peter's name was Simon, by the way. And so Jesus looks at Simon and says, Simon, I'm going to call you Peter because you are a rock. Listen, Simon was the original rock, not Dwayne. Simon was the original rock. He was the original Rocky. When Jesus looked at him, he said, Simon, you are a rock. Man, you are rock solid. You are Rocky. Now, I believe this was a prediction of what Peter would become. Jesus was looking at Peter not for who he was, but who he would become as a result of his connection with Jesus. Do you know Jesus looks at you that way? He looks at you not for who we are, but who we 
can be in him. And he says, you are a rock. Now, what's really funny is that we would never believe that if we, all we knew of Peter was in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if all I know about Peter is for what I learned in the Gospels, it doesn't look like it ends well for him. He ends having denied Christ. He ends having failed to do what he said he was going to do. He's going to be there for, the, for, for Jesus all the way to the bitter end. And, and I mean, apart from the fact that John records for us the, the story in 21 that we looked at last time that he was restored to the apostles, we wouldn't even know that in looking at the Gospels. He looks like a failure. But wow, when we look at the book of Acts, after the resurrection, oh my goodness, he really does become the rock. Look at the message Peter preaches. Now think about this. This is this uneducated fisherman guy. This is the guy that was always sticking his foot in his mouth. This is the guy that was always jumping ahead. He was always doing things the wrong way. This guy preaches this incredible message. And let me tell you this, it's his first sermon. Now, every pastor reluctantly remembers their first sermon. Oh my goodness, I do. We don't have time to talk about that. It was a disaster. It was awful. And Peter turns around, this guy that had never been to seminary, nobody ever taught him how, and he preaches this kind of sermon. We're going to we're going to kind of expand and look at the sermon next week and the re result of it. But I want to read it to you first today because I want you to see the difference between this. So if you have your Bible, Acts chapter 2, begin where we read with verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the 11, raised his voice and declared. So he steps out of the upper room. Streets are filled with people. They're wondering what in the world's going on because they had heard the sound of the rushing mighty wind as the Holy Spirit comes in. And Peter stands up to proclaim, men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let it be known today to you and give heed to my words that these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day. But let me tell you what's happening. This is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And even my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit. And they will prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above. And signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and glorious glorious day of the Lord, the, the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is right out of the book of Joel. So he quotes from the book of Joel. And then he says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by a predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. I mean, you see the boldness that Peter speaks with. God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow the Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness for your presence. Now he goes into the Psalms and he quotes David. Many of the believers or many of the Jewish people listening then thought that David was talking about himself. But look at what Peter says. Brethren, I may confidently say to you that regarding the patriarch David, the one that wrote just what he had finished saying, he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us today. And so because he was a prophet, and he knew that God had sworn to him an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor his flesh undergo decay. 
This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool at your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, talking about Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. Man, what a, what a sermon. I mean, with power and with authority. Here is this uneducated guy who gives insight and wisdom into the Bible. He doesn't just preach the Bible like he knows the Bible. He preaches the Bible like he knows the one that wrote the Bible. That's the same thing I say about Jesus. Peter preaches with the same authority as Jesus, with the same power as Jesus, with the same life-changing results as Jesus. It's incredible. If you read the Gospels, you have to ask yourself the question, how can the man we knew in the Gospels be the same guy that we see before us? What happened to this guy? What we see, first of all, is this. Peter is rock solid. The Gospels end with Peter as a person who had denied Christ and, and, and as an utter failure. But after the resurrection... Peter becomes the leader in Acts chapter 2 when the disciples had gathered in the upper room in the, and they were deciding what they're going to do. Prior to chapter 2, actually, Peter was the one that takes the lead and says, hey, Judas has left us. God in Jesus selected 12 apostles. We need somebody to take Judas's place. And so he leads the group and, and replaces Judas. And then here in chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit comes, he stands up and preaches at Pentecost. Thousands of people had gathered in the street. In fact, at the preaching of this gospel message, 3,000 people will come to faith in Jesus Christ. People who had grown up Jewish will suddenly recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. 3,000 of them would come to know him as Savior did you know that Peter is the first apostle to ever perform miracles? He performs the same kind of miracles that Jesus does. He heals a man at the gate beautiful. He, he, he literally has the power to, to see a person who is dead rise to live again. It is Peter who is arrested and he and John are brought before the, the Sanhedrin. This is the religious elite of the day. These are the educated men who have authority and power, the very ones who orchestrated the arrest and, and, and crucifixion of Jesus. Peter stands before them to boldly proclaim that Jesus is Lord and Christ and you, the very ones who were instigating the crucifixion of Jesus, need to repent He's going to be the same guy that stands up in the early stages of the development of the church and confronts a couple in the church by the name of Ananias and Sapphira, and he pronounces the judgment and the condemnation of God on them. He would be known as a miracle worker. He would be known as the leader of the church, a founder in some sense building on the foundation that Jesus established. It was Peter who was given a vision that the Gentiles, not just Jews, come, come to faith in Christ. It was Peter who was led to proclaim the gospel to a, a, a Roman centurion uh, by, by the name of Cornelius and share the gospel and Cornelius be saved in his whole family and for Peter to, to attest God's purpose and plan is for the whole world to know the gospel and be saved. Peter would be arrested at one point and the church would pray for him and in the whole process of the church praying for Peter, Jesus would, or God would send an angel that would literally deliver Peter in the night. This weak-minded, simple coward of a man 
This hothead, loudmouthed guy was now suddenly a man of conviction, a man of commitment, a man of courage, a man of consistency. He, he's a rock man. No more coward, no more denying Christ, boldly proclaiming Jesus to any who would listen, even to the point of being arrested and threatened only to respond by saying, listen, I, I have to be obedient to God, not man. Peter the lamb-hearted becomes Peter the lion-hearted. And years from this, in the year 64, when Nero became the emperor of Rome, he began to persecute Christians throughout his empire, burned Rome to the ground, blamed it on Christians, and begins to savagely kill Christians. History tells us that Peter, rather than running from that, runs to that. He literally makes a trip to Rome to encourage the persecuted Christians there. While there, the Christians encouraging Peter, man, you are the leader of the church. We need you. If the church has ever needed the leadership, it's now. And man, things are so tough here in Rome. You don't need to be here. You've got to leave. And they encourage Peter to leave. And finally, reluctantly, he agrees. And, and, and history tells us, and, and the story of history, not canonical, not a part of the Bible, but the stories of history tell us that Peter leaves Rome. And as he's on his way away, he has a vision. And he sees Jesus returning to Rome. And he says to him, Jesus, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Rome to be crucified. And Peter at that moment remembered the words that Jesus had spoken to him that we looked at last time we were together in John chapter 21. And when he says, Peter, one of these days, you're going to go where you don't want to go. And your hands are going to be bound. And, and he spoke of the kind of death he would die. And in that moment, Peter was reminded of his denial of Christ. And he turns around and he goes back to Rome. And shortly after that, He's apprehended, sentenced to die of crucifixion. But Peter makes a request before he dies. If I'm going to die of crucifixion, I don't feel worthy to die the same death that Jesus died. Would you crucify me upside down? And history and tradition tells us that Peter was crucified upside down. What, what's the difference between the Peter we know in the gospel and the Peter's that we see here, it's, it's, it's the resurrection. It's the resurrection. The resurrection gave him power that he didn't have before. It, it, it was the resurrection that, that made him the lion-hearted. It, it's the resurrection that enables us to name our children Peter and our dogs Nero. It's the resurrection that makes a difference. What happened? is the question that I have to ask. Secondly, what happened? How did this make a difference? And I say it's the resurrection that changed him. It was the power of the resurrection, the power of the resurrection in us. You see, the power of the resurrection is unlike any power we know in the world today. The power of the resurrection is the ability to take that which is broken, that which is destroyed, that which is dead, and bring it back to life. That's power. We sometimes think power is the ability to destroy something. No, power is the ability to take that which is destroyed and put it back together. And that's what the resurrection power does. It takes lives that have been destroyed and puts them back together. It takes marriages that are destroyed, puts them back together. It takes, it, it, it takes a world that is broken and puts it back together. That's the power of the resurrection. And so... We turn our attention to Acts chapter 2, and in fact, Acts chapter 2 tells us the reason that Peter is different now. Because of the resurrection, we have the ascension. Because of the ascension, we, we have Pentecost. You remember last time we were together on, on Easter, I told you that every now and then the Jewish calendar lines up with a Christian calendar, and, and we actually celebrate Easter on the day that Jesus was raised. He, did, he wasn't raised on Easter 
we know that Jesus was crucified on Passover. He became the Passover lamb. John, before Jesus, when he began his earthly ministry, John, the forerunner of Jesus, proclaimed, here is Jesus, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the Passover lamb. All of the Old Testament celebrations of the Passover point to the time when Jesus will become that lamb who will shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin. Passover, Jesus dies. He is buried. There are three feast days tightly woven together in Passover. And sometimes we just use the term Passover to describe all of these. Jesus died on Passover, but the very next day was another feast day celebration called Unleavened Bread. Jesus died on Passover. He was buried on Unleavened Bread. And then the very third day, or the third day following that Passover, he was buried on Unleavened Bread. And then uh, two days after that, he, he was raised on the Feast of First Fruits. And so when the First Fruits calendar falls on Easter, as it did this year, we celebrate Easter on the day of First Fruits. Jesus was raised on First Fruits. But now listen to this. 50 days after that is Pentecost. The word Pentecost means 50. It means to count. And they would count out 50 days. And it was the celebration of, uh, uh, of, a, of a harvest experience. And so 50 days from there is Pentecost. And so Jesus is with the disciples. 40 days and then 10 days, they're kind of uh, together in, in, in social isolation. And then on Pentecost, on that 50th day, the Holy Spirit comes. Because of the resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. You see, the power of the resurrection is the Holy Spirit. He raises Jesus from the dead. And that same power, remember the song that we sometimes hear today, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, to make that which is dead alive. If you've ever accepted Jesus as your Savior, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. And God's Holy Spirit took the resurrection power of God and he touched you and he restored you and he made you alive in Christ. And the resurrection power lives in us. And that same power that raised Jesus lives in us. But it's not just the power to make us right with God, it's the power to make us live right with God. It gives us the ability to do as Peter did, to become who God intended for us to become. God has so many amazing plans for your life, but you can't do it on your own. He, he has to do it through you. See, he provides the power, but it is through his power. It is his power in us. We allowing him to work in and through us that enables us to live and experience his peace in these times. I mean, God gives us power to live through these troubled times. There's a difference between the way believers walk through these troubled times and unbelievers. We're confident. I have no idea what's going to happen when all of this is over with. I was talking to Warren earlier today, and man, with all kind of webinars that are happening today with people trying to tell pastors, you know, we get together and pastors try to figure out things, and now we're doing webinars on how do we come through this. I don't have a clue. We've never come through this. Nobody can coach me in coming through something that nobody has ever come through before. But let me tell you this, the power of the resurrected Christ lives in me and in you. And he gives us direction and he gives us wisdom and he gives us peace and he gives us purpose. And he's going to bring us through this. So I'm not worried about it. My hope and confidence is in him. Listen, if God has the power to take that which is dead and bring it back to life, he's got the power to take care of whatever issue you face today. You can trust him. And he can make a rock out of us. If he can change Peter's heart, he can change your heart. And so, how does he do it? With the power of the resurrected Christ living in us. God's power in us. Well, quickly, let's go to the last point that I want you to walk away with today, not only do we recognize what happened in Peter's life and the gospels that changed and transformed him into the, the Peter of the, uh, of the book of Acts. But we also see that, that it was the resurrection power of God. But, but what about me, I think, is the question that we ask. That's what happened to him. And you're saying the resurrection power lives in me. So what about me? Well, listen, let me just say this to you. Unlike 
Peter, you and I have never seen Jesus. We never had the opportunity to look into his eye and see the, the, the little sparkle in his eye when he, when he made the jokes that he made. We never got to see the smile. We didn't see the sun dance on his hair. We, we never watched and have had the opportunity to see him say, peace be still, and the wind obey his voice. We've never been able to... Um, see him perform miracles as he did when the disciples that are there trace the footprints that he left in the sand. But listen to me, the same Holy Spirit that transformed the lives of the apostles transforms our lives and lives in us. And though I've never seen any of those things, I know what it is to be touched and changed by the power of God's Holy Spirit and many of you do too. The one difference between today and a normal day is normally you're sitting here and I know many of you having been a pastor here for over 21 years, I, I know many of you in your story. And when I make this statement that God can transform our life, I can say it with such authority when you're in the room because I can look across the room and I can point and ask people to come up on this stage and say, would you tell them the story of how God transformed your life? Because I watched it happen. I've seen it here and here and here and here and all over this room. And the reason I can do that is because that is the same story for every one of us who know Jesus. Every one of us have been transformed by his power. Let me ask you to do something today. Why don't you, while you're sitting there, in the moments that we have together, when we finish this message today, why don't you turn around to the other people that are in the room with you and tell them how God transformed your life. Maybe your children have never heard your story of how you came to know Christ and how you were before and how you are now after. Maybe that's the story that we need to be telling today to those that are around us, and I encourage you and challenge you to do that. The power of God is available but must live through us and in us. He will enable you to become the person that he created you to be. And you will only be the person God created you to be when you include God in your life. It is the resurrection power that provides forgiveness, that mends the broken relationship we have with God so that we can be restored. It's the first step, not the end step. We are restored, and now we can live in the power of the resurrection as we yield to that power not to live in our own strength and our own power. You know from your own experience where that ends up. Most of the time it doesn't end well. It always leaves us inadequate at best. But oh my goodness, <laughs> in his power, we can become who he intended for us to become. When God looked at you at birth, he said, I know what you're going to accomplish if you allow me to be your power and strength. And today, you can experience it. And I just want to encourage you, if you're here, have never accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, the first step of the resurrection power is to acknowledge that I need it. God, I'm a sinner. The reason that you were raised from the dead is so that I could be restored. No matter what I've done, where I've come from, my sin has been forgiven. And all I have to do is access that by coming to him and saying, God, I confess my sin. I agree with you. I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. And if you've done that as a believer, listen, God will transform us as we yield to him. So it may be that as a believer, you've accepted Jesus, but what you need to do is say, God, I want to live life in your power, not in my own, in your strength. I want to get off the throne of my life, and I'm going to let you get on the throne. I want you to be the one that rules my life. And today, that's the prayer that you need to pray, to accept Jesus or to make him Lord again as Peter proclaimed in the text before us. He is both Lord and Christ, and when we make him Lord of our life and yield to him, we access his power that enables us to become who God intended for us to become. And there's no place on the planet like that place. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the message you've given us today. 
the opportunity to see firsthand what it looks like when the resurrection comes alive in us. And God, if you can take somebody like Peter, who in anger cut off the ear of a guy who came to arrest Jesus, who, who in anger stood against Jesus and said, you're not going to go to the cross and become a person who proclaimed the message of the cross of Jesus and uh, resurrection of Jesus to every person he could. If you can do that in his life, then you can, you can change us. So we ask you to forgive us of our sin and we give you control of our lives. As your children, we ask God that you will empower us and teach us to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit so that we can become who you've called us to become and live life as you've called us to live it. In Jesus' name, amen.